name's Shannon, uh, one of the Emerge residents here. I'm also one of the uh, fellows in critical care. Uh, happy to present Grand Rounds today for you guys on uh, recent advances in the management of shock. Um, some acknowledgements quickly uh, to Dr. Hickey. Um, those of you who have uh, Facebook or WhatsApp and who are wondering if he is actually a physician, I am told that he is. Um, and I'm very appreciative of uh, all of his uh, help, both uh, within and outside of the ICU. Uh, to my colleague and friend, Rebecca Matthew, who's, as many of you know, one of the cardio our cardiologists and ICU fellows, who her and Ben Hibbert helped me a lot with the, the cardiogenic shock proportion of this. Uh, and Bram Rochford, who's an intensivist uh, at McMaster, one of my uh, mentors in critical care, who uh, helped me with some of my septic shock slides. So, I presume most of the people here work in the emergency department, and the mantra of the emergency department is you see everything uh, that walks in the door. But I think for most of us, we take particular pride in the way we treat patients who have critical illness. Uh, emergency medicine, to a lot of people, is synonymous with resuscitation. It's a critical aspect of what we do, and so a lot of us take pride in, in keeping up to date with it. And I think for the general public, they might see it something like this. Um, I don't necessarily see it that way, but I think a lot of people think of it like this, is you know, that emergency physician staring death in the face and trying to save the patient from an, un uh, an unfortunate outcome using the knowledge uh, and skills that they have. But the truth is to stay on top of all of that actually requires a fair amount of reading, uh, and that means often going back to the primary literature. And so my goal today is to try and provide all of you with some information from the primary literature, because the one thing I've learned in my last year of training in the, in, in, in the ICU is that most of the, the large majority of the resuscitation done in the emergency department is fantastic. And so I'm taking people, trying to take people who already have very strong knowledge of resuscitative medicine and trying to make things maybe a little bit better. And that's kind of how I would look at this talk. So this is like a re relatively higher level stuff, but I think the way we focus uh, our therapies in the emergency department, the way we, we are focused on resuscitation, I think this is the next step uh, in, in what we do. So what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna to spend the majority of time talking about septic shock. It is far and away the most common type of shock we see in the emergency department. Uh, it's over 50% of the patients that we see with shock. We're gonna talk a bit about cardiogenic shock, um, some specifics related to, uh, to, the, to the University of Ottawa and the Ottawa Hospital. We'll talk about pulmonary embolism, RV failure, and very, very briefly, we'll talk about an approach, put it all together, an approach to the patient that we sometimes might see, which is the patient with undifferentiated shock. I am not going to talk about certain things, uh, certain types of shock that have obvious treatments. So hemorrhagic shock, tamponade, adrenal insufficiency, anaphylactic shock all have very prescribed therapies that haven't changed literally for decades. Uh, and there's really no new evidence to talk about. Um, and then cardiac arrest, Bo did an amazing job talking about this last week and I effectively agreed with everything he said. So I would just refer you guys to, to that, uh, that presentation. I'm also gonna refer a lot to this. I don't know how many people have seen this. Some of the R5s might have seen this in the midst of studying for the exam this year, but these are the VICE guidelines. Uh, they are produced by CAPE. Um, so it's a vasopressin iotrope used in Canadian emergency departments, done by a lot of people we know. Uh, Dennis Jogovich, who's an emergency physician and intensivist in Edmonton, and Dan Howes, who was an emergency physician and intensivist in Kingston, and a lot of prominent emergency physician intensivists in Canada. So Rob Green, uh, Sarah Gray, Dave Messenger. And this is more, not really a guideline, it's more of um, you know, expert consensus on what to do. And I can tell you that there's no plan to update this anytime soon. So uh, these are so relatively old from 2015, and we'll talk about how they, they match up to the evidence today. So where it's available, I'll cite guidelines, because I think generally speaking, guidelines are the highest level of evidence. Um, they have usually gone through a very rigorous process of not just searching for the, uh, the evidence, but often doing meta-analysis. Um, and if guidelines don't exist, I'll try and point to the relevant literature. And if the relevant literature doesn't exist, I'll just be very clear that there is no evidence uh, about that. So to that end, we'll start with a case. Um, this is not M&M round, so we, can, we don't need anonymity, but this is a case that I actually saw three months ago, I was working with Eric Mutter in recess at the Civic. So this is David, 65-year-old gentleman, history of multiple myeloma. He's on active therapy, so he's on pomalidomide and dexamethasone, which is a very common uh, regimen that we see myeloma patients on here in Ottawa. Uh, and he was brought to the emergency department by EMS. Uh, they had been called by his wife. Basically, he had been coughing for several days, and in the last 24 hours, the one thing his wife noticed is he'd become very, very confused um, and worsening shortness of breath. So he arrives in, the, in recess, actually, and his vital signs are, are as you would expect them given the case, right? He's febrile, he's tachycardic, he's hypotensive, uh, and he's hypoxemic. And uh, his lactate is 5.4, and his, he's got other evidence of end organ dysfunction, right? He's got AKI, he's got a high billy. You shoot an x-ray, very clear low bar pneumonia, and so you think, I got the therapy for this, it's pretty straightforward. So we started him on two liters of uh, crystalloid fluid, we 
drew blood cultures, we started antibiotics, I gave him a dose of hydrocortisone because he was already on dexamethasone. Um, and then literally about an, like 30 minutes later, he had the two liters of fluid pretty quickly and his blood pressure hadn't budged. So this is very clearly, and I think everybody in the room has put together septic shock. It is far and away the most type, common type of shock that you will see in the emergency department. Like I said, up to 60% of the patients that we see in shock in the emergency department actually have septic shock. And so it's really important to be uh, up to date with the therapy uh, in this disease. So as many of you know, septic shock is characterized by vasodilatory shock, but it means as your vessels are what some people call vasoplegia, right? They're very, very dilated. But we also know that it's marked by cardiac dysfunction. So we've known this for over 15 years, and there's a lot of really good review articles that look at the fact that this is really multifactorial pathophysiology that not only causes your vessels to dilate, but also causes your heart to not pump uh, as strong as you'd like it to. And so in 2016, uh, we were lucky because we got probably the most up-to-date version of the surviving sepsis campaign. So this is sort of the Bible for the management of patients with sepsis and sepsis shock. So this was the third iteration. They started in 2008, and they literally just met this week uh, in Chicago for the 2020 version of septic shock. And so the things I'm going to talk to you of surviving sepsis, and so the things I'm going to talk to you about today um, are effectively updates that I'm pretty sure are going to be in the next version um, based on the literature that has come out since uh, the surviving sepsis guidelines. And the good news is, I think most people know, if you get asked this question on a Royal College exam or by somebody, what's the first vasoactive medication you use in septic shock, I think everybody knows the answer is norepinephrine. And this is supported by multiple guidelines. So on the left, the surviving sepsis guidelines make a strong recommendation for norepinephrine. And on the right, that's the VICE guidelines from 2015. They also make a strong recommendation for norepinephrine in the patient you know has septic shock. Nothing really new. So norepinephrine. Is, uh, is, is Captain America. So this is, uh, this is like a sequence. I don't know how many of you have seen this by Kathy Shoshan, who's an internal medicine resident at UCSF, which beautifully, she made these beautiful cartoons that demonstrate how the various vasoactive medications work, and they're incredibly accurate. So uh, in this case, levofed or norepinephrine, as we know, acts on beta-1 receptors in the heart, increases cardiac output and heart rate. It also acts on alpha-1 receptors, increases uh, the vascular tone, but also acts on beta-2 receptors. We don't talk about that that much, but it actually acts on the microcirculation to improve perfusion to the individual organs. So pathophysiologically, it makes really great sense why norepinephrine is our first choice vasopressor. So in this case, we go back to our case, I started him on norepinephrine relatively quickly, um, but then before I knew it, I was up to 15 mics a minute of norepinephrine. His blood pressure was still quite low. Uh, he was still acidemic, and uh, his lactate actually went up, uh, which is concerning. And I won't spend too much talking about time talking about lactate. I think Garrick's going to talk about it in his grand rounds. I'm not somebody, like, anybody who works with me in the ICU knows I really love lactate, but I don't really subscribe to it if it's going down. I'm not like everything's going to be fine. But if it's going up, I generally think of that as a really bad sign. So the question then is what vasoactive medication do you do use next? And the truth is the current guidelines don't really support you on this. So they'll say that you should either consider adding vasopressin up to 0.03, and we'll talk about that, or epinephrine, either one, both weak recommendations. So this is surviving sepsis or consider adding vasopressin to try and reduce your norepinephrine. Um, so it, it's, you'll often see that actually practice a split on this, uh, not so much at our center, but at other centers. And a lot of people go to epinephrine. And epinephrine might seem logical, but there's really important caveats that you should know if you're ever going to try and use it in a patient with shock. So epinephrine really is, is Iron Man, right? It's like kick down the door, run in the room, and it has saved me many, many times uh, in situations where patients were peri-arrest or not doing very well. And as we know, it acts very similarly to norepinephrine, right? Acts on beta-1, acts on beta-2, acts on alpha-1. But there are really, really important caveats that epinephrine has. And so this is a pretty landmark trial. It was done in 2008. Uh, most of the critical care fellows know it. It's a CAT trial from Australia. And basically what they showed was two major problems with epinephrine in comparison to norepinephrine. On the left side, you can see that epinephrine markedly increases your heart rate a lot more than norepinephrine and actually increases the likelihood of atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation in a patient who has shock is a very, very bad prognostic indicator. It's been shown in literally every single study that has ever looked at this and in recent meta-analyses that, as you can imagine, in a patient with shock, you really need to per maintain perfusion, and atrial fibrillation will affect that. And epinephrine markedly increases the likelihood of atrial fibrillation. On the right, you can see that epinephrine also increases the, high, the, the level of lactate in your blood, and that does that by acting on skeletal muscle. And lactate, when it's elevated in your blood, will affect your pH and make you more acidotic. So there are a lot of reasons why epinephrine has problems. And so what I'm hoping to convince you today is that the evidence is actually starting to favor vasopressin, actually, as a second-line presser in septic shock. And we often make fun of vasopressin because nobody uses it, but I'll hopefully through this talk convince you that you should be reaching for this as your second presser in most cases. So vasopressin or ADH 
uh, often used in conjunction with norepinephrine, right? You should probably never use it alone, uh, and it acts on vasopressin receptors. So those exist in the vessels. They cause increased the systemic vascular resistance. They also work on the kidney to increase your reabsorption of water and your circulating blood volume. So in and of itself, it makes really great sense. And the evidence came, that came towards this came from a really landmark uh, systematic review meta-analysis that was published in JAMA just last year. Uh, it was done by Bill McIntyre, who's a cardiologist. Uh, he was actually my senior resident when I was at Queen's. He's a cardiologist at Mac now. Um, and what they looked at was if you add vasopressin to a catecholamine like norepinephrine versus norepinephrine alone, does it have effects on patients with distributive shock? And so first they looked at patients with atrial fibrillation. And what they found, or the, the incidence of atrial fibrillation, and then found that if you add vasopressin, you decrease the likelihood of atrial fibrillation. And that's an important outcome, like I talked about, because atrial fibrillation is associated with worse outcomes. They kind of expected to find this. What they didn't expect to find, but what they showed was a mortality benefit. There is a mortality benefit if you add vasopressin to norepinephrine in patients with vasodilatory shock. They also looked at a number of various other outcomes to try and see, well, is there any harm with vasopressin? And they only found one thing which is actually pretty reasonably important, and, and that's vasopressin increases the likelihood of digital ischemia. I've never seen this uh, in using vasopressin, but it is apparently relatively, uh, relatively common. Um, and so what we had to do then was go through all of the evidence and say, if we have these benefits of vasopressin and these potential downsides, what's the recommendation or what's the, what, what should we do from a guideline perspective? So they're addressing this in surviving sepsis. We address this at the Canadian Critical Care Society. So this is the upcoming guidelines on the use of vasopressin. So this just got accepted and should be published in the next couple of weeks. Um, and this, what, what we did also was we went back to patients and we said, these are the potential benefits of vasopressin. These are the potential downsides. What would you, what do you value? Uh, and what most patients said is, well, we value life and we value, you know, being alive and we really like our digits, but we would prefer to be alive. Um, and so ultimately the recommendation that ended up coming out, and I suspect the recommendation that will come out from surviving sepsis as well, is that you should consider using vasopressin in addition to catecholamines, uh, overusing catecholamines alone. And this doesn't just mean when you get to 20 of norepi you start vaso. I start vaso now if I get to 8 to 10 of norepi just to try and spare the amount of norepi that I'm using. The other major question that is being tackled right now by surviving sepsis is what about steroids? I'm sure a lot of people who know this area are very tired of hearing about this question. Um, it's been done so many times, and it was actually a, a thing that came from uh, Jalali Anan and Paul Merrick, they're both intensivists, Anan in, in France and Paul Merrick in the United States, where they have actually showed on a, on a basic science level, if you look at animals and in patients, that when patients develop critical illness, they develop adrenal insufficiency. It's not it's through a variety of mechanisms, and I'm not just talking about the patient who's chronically on steroids, because most of us would give that patient steroids anyway. But in any other patient, when they develop critical illness, they develop renal, uh, adrenal insufficiency. So the question is, what should we do? Well, the previous iteration of surviving sepsis actually recommended against giving steroids if the patient was already kind of on the upswing. So if you've given fluids and pressors and things that you'd restored hemodynamics, then the question then they said, well, we probably don't need hydrocortisone. Only consider it if uh, your patient didn't achieve that. But what has since happened is two really large randomized control trials have come out, uh, adrenal and approaches, adrenal uh, in Australia and uh, approaches in France. And uh, we covered actually both of these trials in our journal club, but they both got published after surviving sepsis. And they markedly changed the landscape because before that there was about 38 trials that have been done on this. But you can see in adrenal and approaches together more than double the number of patients in all of the trials before. So this is really the best evidence that we have so to go through the trials really, really quickly, the only thing you really need to know about these two trials I've summarized in this table. So adrenal looked at, both of them looked at septic shock patients. Adrenal looked at much sicker septic shock patients, so patients who had mechanical ventilation or who were intubated. And they also gave hydrocortisone as an infusion, which most people don't do, but they're just trying to leave the levels at a relatively high level. Uh, approaches, on the other hand, gave it to patients really quickly. So within 24 hours of onset of septic shock, you had to get treated with steroids, and they additionally gave a mineralocorticoid uh, in addition to hydrocortisone. What's important is that these trials showed very different results. So adrenal showed no effect of steroids in septic shock, um, but approaches, you can see, a pretty sizable mortality benefit. And it's important because they actually showed the same thing when it comes to resolution of shock or vasopressors coming off, that actually adrenal, even though it showed no mortality benefit, actually showed that patients who got hydrocortisone had faster resolution of shock, uh, and more of them were likely to achieve that. 
So now that there's been all this evidence, Bram and his group went ahead and did uh, an updated systematic review and meta-analysis that was published uh, last year. And they looked at the pros and cons of giving steroids in septic shock. What they found is that mortality, there's actually no statistically significant benefit, although there was a trend towards benefit with giving steroids. What they, also, what they did show, though, was that steroids greatly reduce the, the re, uh, reversal of shock, or increase the reversal of shock, rather, and greatly reduce the organ failure, or the SOFA score, at one week. Are there downsides? There are downsides, and they looked at that. So, so steroids increase the risk of hypernatremia, increase the risk of hyperglycemia, uh, and they also cause neuromuscular weakness or associated with neuromuscular weakness. So hypernatremia, hyperglycemia, not really a big deal. Neuromuscular weakness potentially actually devastating if it occurs, uh, depending on the degree, but relatively low. Uh, and so what they did, again, was they created a guideline. So this is the guideline that was published in the BMJ last year. Uh, on how to give steroids. And again, this is what they're looking at when they're doing surviving sepsis is the same data. So this was led by uh, Francois Lamontin, who's an intensivist at Sherbrooke. And what they said is that in any patient with sepsis, not even necessarily shock, and patients who don't already have ex existing adrenal insufficiency, because you know if somebody's on steroids, they should probably get it anyway, they actually ended up making a weak recommendation for the use of corticosteroids. So how does this translate into our practice? Well, generally speaking, I think most of us, especially in the ICU, have transitioned to giving steroids relatively early in patients as soon as they go on pressors, basically. It used to be that you'd wait till the second or third presser went on, but this, the data from approaches suggests that it should happen relatively early. And I think for the emergency department, if you start as steroids on somebody, I doubt anybody would be uh, very upset with you. And in fact, it's very likely that we would continue that therapy if that patient was put on uh, pressors. The last thing I want to talk about, because you can't talk about septic shock these days without talking about it, is vitamin C. So many people may have heard about that, and if you haven't, you're probably wondering, well, why might vitamin C be considered a treatment for sepsis and septic shock? And it all comes from this idea uh, of, uh, put forward by Paul Merrick, who's an intensivist in the United States, um, and he says that sepsis and septic shock are metabolically demanding, right? They drain your metabolites. And actually, what he has shown, actually, multiple times is that patients who have sepsis have depleted vitamin C levels, markedly deplete. So basically what he says is they have scurvy. And as we know, and we don't see scurvy that often anymore, but scurvy is associated with organ dysfunction and death. And he says, well, this is the same thing that happens in septic shock. And in 2016, several of you may know, this study was published in CHEST. It largely changed the way I think people think about the management of septic shock. So this is hydrocortisone, vitamin C, and thiamine for the treatment of sepsis and septic shock. Uh, this is, uh, to be very clear about the methods of this study, a retrospective before and after study. So this was at a single center where for seven months, every patient got treated with what they call the HAT protocol. Hydrocortisone, ascorbic acid, and thiamine. Ascorbic acid being vitamin C. And what they did was they took those patients from those seven months and just compared them to patients from the seven months previously. So it's a total before and after. It's far, far from an RCT. Um, and there's only 40 patients in each group. But what they showed was striking. So they showed that patients who got vitamin C had huge reductions in organ failure, as, even as early as day two. They also showed that norepinephrine just melted away in patients that got vitamin C. And most importantly and most striking, they showed a huge mortality benefit with vitamin C. They dropped the, set, the mortality of septic shock from 40%, which is very deadly disease that we see worldwide, to less than 9% with just the addition of this protocol, with a number needed to treat of about three. So needless to say, there was a lot of outcry about this. So this is like all of the, the letters that Paul Merrick had to write back to Chest in response to all the letters of ed to the editor that went, uh, went forward. And what's actually crazy is the, the, so the, the media got a hold of this, right? And it started to get put out everywhere that Paul Merrick had basically cured uh, septic shock with vitamin C. And I, I think I told a lot of people this story. I was in the ICU last year, and we had this horrific case of a 45-year-old woman who was dying from septic shock. And uh, she had E. coli bacteremia. And her husband, I spent the whole night one night talking to her husband about everything that was going on. And the next morning, he showed up to the ICU with a printout of this, the one you see at the very middle there, which is actually, believe it or not, from Whole Foods magazine. And he said, if this is the treatment for sepsis and septic shock, why are you not giving it to my wife? And so it tells you the importance of why we got in this weird discussion about like, evidence and why we didn't know that it was necessarily efficacious. And last year, uh, at our Canadian Critical Care Conference, they invited Paul Merrick to talk about this. Uh, and it was very, very heated. And at one point, he said to everybody out there, he said, if you take care of a patient with septic shock and you don't give them vitamin C, he said, you are letting your patients die. 
which did not play well uh, in that population of people who were there. But most importantly, he said he said he could not participate in an RCT on vitamin C because he felt it was unethical, because he did not believe there was clinical equipoise. So fortunately, no one else subscribed to this level of thinking. And the reason I'm talking about this is because the first RCT actually just came out in JAMA two months ago. So this was citrus ALI. This is the effect of vitamin C infusion on patients with septic shock and respiratory failure. And what's important to know is this is done at six centers in the United States, published in JAMA just two months ago, is in this study, uh, they looked at 167 patients, but very sick patients, so septic shock and mechanical ventilation for ARDS. So they actually had to develop ARDS. And they either got it, it, uh, randomized to receive vitamin C or placebo. Uh, and the reason for that is they just didn't feel that the other parts of this, the, the HAT protocol were efficacious. So they were really only uh, wanted to treat vitamin C. And their primary outcome is interesting. It's not a patient-centered outcome. Their primary outcome is SOFA score reduction. Because they said, well, if you go back to Dr. Merrick's original study, he showed that SOFA scores dropped drastically. Also, we have 160 patients. It's unlikely we're going to show a mortality benefit. So let's just see if we can at least reduce organ failure with vitamin C. Anybody know what they found? Nothing. No difference in organ failure at 96 hours. But this was, the, this was their primary outcome, and this got no attention. And the reason it got no attention is because they published Kaplan-Meier curves. And this is what the Kaplan-Meier curves look like. Survival was markedly better in the patients who got vitamin C. And the p-value is 0.03. It's highly, highly, it's highly unstable in the sense that if one patient switched from either group, it would become statistically insignificant. But if you forget about statistical significance, clinically that looks very real. And they had no explanation for this because you can see the, the lines separate almost immediately, but organ failure at 96 hours is the same. So they don't really have a mechanism to explain how this might happen. And so it really left actually more questions than answers. Um, and there's two ongoing very large trials uh, on this. Victus, I, I don't understand these trial names, but Victus is the current trial that's going on in the United States uh, at 60 hospitals. Um, and Love It is actually the, the Canadian, this is a Canadian trial. And it's actually, I know, it's a Canadian trial. It's actually a trial we're running here in Ottawa. Um, so the Francois Lamontagne, who I talked about earlier, is the principal investigator. Our local principal investigator is Andrew Seeley. Um, and I actually spoke to him and Sal Kanji before this talk. And I said, can we give vitamin C if we wanted to in the emergency department? And he said, you can. We have it. But if you could save it for the trial, we'd really appreciate that. So that, just so you guys know, that's the party line. Um, and this was uh, Francois talking about this. I don't know how well this shows up, probably not well at all. But he was talking about this at the Canadian Critical Care Conference last year. And if you can't see at the very bottom, though, the Citrus ALI trial that I already showed you had 170 patients. It's actually one of the smaller trials. Love It is scheduled for 800 people. And Victus is scheduled for 2,000 people, or 2,000 patients. Um, the fourth trial, or the fifth trial on there is this trial called Vitamins. It's already done in Australia, and the results are going to be released uh, actually in January uh, of next year. This is like the beauty of social media where trials actually look like movie trailers now. Like before you used to find out, before you used to find out like once it got published, but now you know like months and months in advance that the trial's coming out. So th what's interesting about Vitamins is they actually used the entire protocol. So they used vitamin C, thiamine, and hydrocortisone. And actually Paul Merrick is going to be there when the results are revealed. Uh, and he's actually going to give the editorial comment on it. So take all measures on septic and septic shock then. Obviously, nothing has changed with regards to norepinephrine, first-line presser. I hopefully have convinced you that you should consider vasopressin relatively early as your second-line presser in septic shock. Um, consider early initiation of corticosteroids. Like I said, I think most of us in the ICU are moving towards this. And just know that vitamin C is being tested uh, in multiple randomized trials and may very well turn out to be efficacious, which would mean Paul Merrick was right all along. So our next case, that's all I want to say about septic shock. Our next case, a lot of you might know. I don't think anybody in this room was actually involved, but it was a very, very dramatic case. It was a 45-year-old guy who was totally otherwise healthy, extremely active. He's actually a marathoner. Um, he was coughing for about two weeks before he presented to the emergency department. And then two days before he showed up, he started having horrific shortness of breath where he couldn't even climb the stairs, like totally healthy guy. Um, and very dramatically, actually, his wife came home one day and found him basically almost peri arrest on the floor. Uh, he, she thought he had gone to work. He had never actually gone to work all day. Um, and uh, EMS was called. He was rushed to the emergency department, and his vitals were, were like, very scary. So he was very, very hypotensive, very, very tachypneic. He was very, very hypoxic. Um, I, when, by the time I had seen him, he was very, very cool, clammy. He was very shut down. He was totally modeled to his knees. His lactate came back at 7.1. His troponin was 1,100. He had no chest pain. His ECG actually showed that he had sinus tack with no ischemic changes. 
Uh, and a very diligent emergency physician put the POCUS on and, and looked at his left ventricle, and it was markedly dilated with an EF of 10% uh, and diagnosed him with cardiogenic shock. So cardiogenic shock is something that we're seeing. We often think of it in the course of MI. This patient didn't ultimately have an MI, um, but it's definitely a type of shock that we'll see. Dr. Froschel actually talked about this a lot in his rounds. There are no guidelines for the management of cardiogenic shock. This is the closest thing. It's an AHA scientific statement on how to best manage this, but there are no guidelines. Um, and I don't know how many people are familiar with this, but there's actually a code shock at the Heart Institute. Um, a lot of people actually don't know that. You will probably never call it as an emergency physician, but what's important to know about cardiogenic shock is we're up at the very top there in the first rectangle. So res initial resuscitation, inotropes, vasopressors, potentially mechanical ventilation. Everything after is cardiology. So it's reperfusion therapy if you think that this is ischemic. And then after that, it's mechanical circulatory support. So it's putting in a balloon pump or putting the patient, uh, giving the patient a VAD or putting them on ECMO. And that really needs to get activated. If you're the civic, it's probably not a problem because the civic, our consults are always to the cardiology fellow. But if you're at the general, especially in the middle of the night, just realize that whoever's covering cardiology might be an R1 off service. They may not review with the, the staff until the next morning. Uh, and so if you think the patient has cardiogenic shock, even if you think it's not ischemic, it's worth discussing it with the Heart Institute fellow on call. So the question really that we wanted to answer is what vasoactive agent should we use in patients with cardiogenic shock? So in this patient that we saw. The problem is nobody knows, and that's because there's really no evidence. Um, the closest thing are these, is this AHA scientific statement, which says you should use norepinephrine first. And actually the VICE guidelines from 2015 from Dennis Djokovic uh, and the rest of uh, those intensivists, emergency physician intensivists, say, make, actually made a strong recommendation that you should use norepinephrine. The reason this came out is from one trial uh, where it was patients with septic shock, and it was from one subgroup that showed norepinephrine was suitable or was superior to dopamine. But there's really actually no evidence. So the question then becomes, well, what if you need an inotrope? Because if you start somebody on norepinephrine, sure, you're going to push their heart a little bit, but you're also going to cause vasoconstriction and increase afterload. So you may need, ideally, an inotrope. And nobody, again, comments on this. So at the bottom, uh, there's a conditional recommendation from Vice that says that you should consider dobutamine. And I don't know how many people have used dobutamine in the emergency department. It is very much Thor. It is a very, very strong inotrope. Um, so it acts on beta-1 to increase contractility and heart rate. And it actually has this very small effect on beta-2 to decrease systemic vascular resistance. The problem with dobutamine, as many people know, is it is very, very arrhythmogenic. So it causes atrial fibrillation, I think upwards of 75 to 80% of the time that it's used, which in a patient with cardiac, cardiogenic shock is probably suboptimal. And so for that reason, a lot of people started to switch to milrinone. So milrinone is probably the drug of choice used in the ICU, or sorry, in the CCU, um, and it works on PDE3 inhibitors. So or it's a PDE3 inhibitor. So it acts on the heart to increase calcium, and it acts on the vessels to increase vasodilation. So unlike dobutamine, it's way more associated with hypotension and vasodilation, but it causes much less atrial fibrillation. And so a lot of people seem to like that in the use, uh, in the treatment of cardiogenic shock. And the truth is there's actually very little evidence comparing dobutamine and milrinone. And so when I was looking at this question, I consulted with Rebecca, because this is the focus of her uh, research program at the Heart Institute, is comparing milrinone and dobutamine in patients with cardiogenic shock. So she originally started by looking at, like, what is the evidence, and it's bad. So there's only a single RCT of 36 patients, uh, and this is their meta-analysis of the other 11 uh, observational studies, which actually really show there's no difference. Interestingly, if you look at the long-term outcomes, they seem to favor milrinone, but, I mean, it's hard. Most of these studies are observational. There's no way... Uh, to take away the, the bias associated with that. And so, as many people know, at the Heart Institute this year, or last, starting last year, actually, they started a randomized control trial looking at milrinone versus dobutamine. They only have, Rebecca told me, about 20-some-odd patients left to go of the 192 that they wanted. It's called, it's called Doremi, dobutamine versus milrinone. That's a pretty good trial now. Um, but, uh, and so hopefully we'll have answers soon about uh, what we should be using. Um, so this patient, actually, Mike, uh, our patient with cardiogenic shock, he was started on dobutamine, and cardiology was urgently consulted. Um, they put him on BiPAP originally in the emergency department, and he failed BiPAP very quickly. So uh, the emergency physician actually made the decision to intubate him, which I think was the right decision. He went immediately to the cath lab, where they shot his, angiogra they shot his angiogram, and his coronaries were completely clean, as you'd expect in a 40-year-old marathoner. What they found is LVF was about 5 to 10%, and they strongly suspected that he had giant cell myocarditis, which is a fulminant, cause of, uh, fulminant type of myocarditis, which has an 80% mortality rate. Um, so they put in a balloon pump in the cath lab, and I was actually working in the CSICU, and they called us and said, well, he's, he's actually going downhill with this balloon pump. We need to put him on VA ECMO. Uh, 
Um, so they put him on VA ECMO, like literally three hours after he came to the emergency department. He got it listed urgently for cardiac transplant. Uh, and then four days later, he got his cardiac transplant. Um, and then four days after that, he left the CSICU. And three weeks later, he went home. And uh, I actually uh, chatted with him recently because we were doing a study on ECMO survivorship and qualitative studies, so I got to interview him. And he's actually doing very, very well. So the take-home message actually is first, pardon? He can't run. I actually specifically asked him that. But he's like, he can walk on a treadmill. It's been about a year, but he's, he's working towards it. Um, so uh, the take-home message is always consider cardiogenic shock in the patient with cold shock. So Dr. Froschel talked about this in his rounds. These patients often present with atypical symptoms, so they might have abdominal pain. But if they look cool and shut down, consider the diagnosis of cardiogenic shock. Existing guidelines would suggest that norepinephrine should be used first, so I think for us that's still the case. Um, and there's very little evidence comparing inotrope agents. So I spoke to the cardiologist and I said, well, if we had to start one thing, would it be dobutamine or milrinone? And they said dobutamine. And the reason is because it's much faster onset than milrinone. Um, and so for now, consider that if you felt that you needed an inotrope if you're managing a patient with cardiogenic shock. And like I mentioned always, and they, they reiterated this, please call the Heart Institute, if you're, especially if you're at the general. Um, if you're at the general during the day, they expect that the cardiology staff will call them at the general. But if it's in the middle of the night, they're very happy to hear from you if you think a patient's in cardiogenic shock and might require further therapy. So the last case we're going to talk about is a case uh, called Sarah. Again, some of you might know this case is very dramatic as well. So she was a 21-year-old, I was going to say was, she's still alive. She's a 21-year-old female university student who's otherwise healthy. Her only risk factor was oral contraceptives. Um, she originally had presented to a walk-in clinic with a one-day history of shortness of breath um, and was discharged home with a puffer. Um, she tried the puffer. It didn't really help. And the next day, her worst shortness of breath got so bad that her roommates uh, at university actually called EMS. She arrived with, again, very scary vitals. So her heart rate was 135. She was to Kipnik. She was hypotensive. Um, and she was hypoxic. So uh, the, we got called from the ICU to see her relatively quickly um, because she was very, very unstable. She was cool and clammy, uh, and she had lower extremity modeling. And the one thing I'll remember from seeing her was her JVP was just bounding. You could see it from li literally across the room. Um, her initial lactate was 6.1. Her troponin was 1,100. And ECG showed sinus tachycardia, very clear RV strain pattern. Um, and bedside focus showed marked IV dilatation and severe RV dysfunction. Everyone agreed she was way too stable, to go, unstable to go to the CT scan. And so we spoke to thrombosis, and all of us emergency medicine ICU thrombosis made the decision to empirically give her lytics. Um, so she got the lytics, and she was still in the, in the eMERGE for about a half an hour, and she was still quite hypotensive. Um, and so this is, as you probably guessed, pulmonary embolism and RV strain. And I've taken care of a fair number of patients with shock. Without question, acute RV failure is the hardest type of shock to treat, without question. We've already had like a few case rounds this year. I think Garrick's was one of them, of a patient with decompensated RV failure, and these patients arrest very, very quickly. And the reason for that is, as some of you may know, is the spiral of death. So when you have, you know, increased RV afterload or pulmonary hypertension, like from a PE, you, re you have RV dilatation. Uh, and because of that, you have increased wall tension, increased ischemia, Increased ischemia means in decreased RV output, which ultimately will mean decreased LV output, and then decreased coronary perfusion, and it just cycles over and over again. And so these patients can go into cardiogenic shock and die very, very quickly. The RV sucks at compensating against pressure. So this is a really nice diagram that shows if you increase the pulmonary pressures by even 20, the RV just decompensates, whereas the LV in the light of systemic afterload will support itself for a decent amount of time. There's also this idea of interventricular interdependence, which hopefully people are starting to learn about, which states that as the RV gets more dilated, it will actually reduce LV filling, because it'll constrict the LV, and LV outflow. And so the reason for, to know that is because you really need to be careful with fluids. We were always taught that patients with RV failure, whether they have RVMI or PE, were very, very preload dependent, and that's definitely true, but to a point. Eventually, you can give enough fluids, and it probably won't take long before you start inhibiting the LV output. So the question then is, how do we support the hemodynamics in acute RV failure? And again, there are no guidelines on this. There's also just an AHA scientific statement. Um, I encourage you guys to read this article. Half of it is useless because it talks about chronic RV failure, which for us is not useful. Um, but half of it is about acute RV failure, which is very much what we might deal with in the emergency department. And what they say is, well, there's two ways to basically treat this cycle of death. First, you can focus on decreasing the RV afterload, which I'll convince you is difficult. Uh, and the second thing you can do is affix the RV contractility. So decreasing RV afterload, well, that's the point of giving lytics. Um, is there anything else we can do? How do we unload the RV 
uh, in the setting of severe acute pulmonary hypertension. And this was a trial that tried to get out this. So this is a trial by Jeff Klein. Many of you know the creator of the Perk score, uh, pretty much the emergency department uh, equivalent of, of Phil Wells in terms of uh, his knowledge of um, venous thromboembolism. And what he wanted to look at was if you could give patients inhaled nitric oxide to try and reduce RV afterload. Um, and the reason for doing inhaled, RV, uh, inhaled nitrous oxide is it causes less hypotension than giving them systemic drugs. Um, so he did this trial, and it was uh, in just 78 patients who had, RV, who had RV dysfunction in the context of PE. And he said, and he randomized them to inhale nitrous oxide or not. Um, and the primary outcome was a normal RV on echo and a lack of a trope. And what he found was that actually there was a trend towards improvement with uh, the, the nitrous oxide, but he comments in the paper that unfortunately they had too small of a sample size to show a benefit. And he also commented that they ended up causing a lot of systemic hypotension with this. So I would say that this is so far from prime time, um, but it's still something that I think is interesting that may become clear. And in the AHA guideline, they do say that inhaled agents are potentially beneficial because they might uh, avoid systemic hypotension, but uh, Dr. Klein's trial shows that that's not the case. So the better question is, how do we augment contractility? So you've given this patient their lytics, and they're still hypotensive, they're still in shock. You need to help them a little bit. Um, and there are suggestions, but again, there's really actually no evidence on this topic. So norepinephrine, probably sound like a broken record, is probably your first choice. So this is from the AHA guidelines that say that you can use dopamine, norepinephrine, or epinephrine. Um, but what they also suggest is using vasopressin. And so vasopressin has a number of benefits. So it actually restricts the pulmonary vasculature much less than norepinephrine. So if you start norepinephrine, you're going to get alpha squeeze on your, on your pulmonary uh, vasculature, which is suboptimal in the setting of uh, RV failure. Um, but also, similarly, vasopressin will reduce your arrhythmogenics and reduce your likelihood of AFib. So in, in this patient we'll talk about, uh, we actually did start her on vasopressin relatively early. And then appropriate disposition is key. So um, if the diagnosis is pulmonary embolism, then the patient should go to the ICU for sure. If the diagnosis is anything else, obviously RVMI, but almost any other cause of a decompensated RV failure, and you think that's primarily what's driving the patient's shock, then cardiology needs to be involved because effectively this is cardiogenic shock, and many of these patients might go on to need mechanical circulatory support. Um, so if you go back to the case of Sarah, and I should say also, in our patients with PE who have persistent RV dysfunction even after lytics, we will call cardiology for consideration of mechanical circulatory support. So she was started on norepinephrine and vasopressin. We ultimately ended up stabilizing her to go to the scanner. Unsurprisingly, it showed large bilateral pulmonary emboli, RV, right heart strain. She went to the ICU with thrombosis. In discussion with thrombosis, we ended up giving her second dose of lytics. Um, and she was gradually weaned from vasoactive medications, discharged home, or discharged the ward rather two days later. She went home a week later. Um, so our take home messages then with RV dysfunction is be prepared for continued hemodynamic support um, in patients with acute PE. Even if you've given them thrombolytics, it's not necessarily going to be efficacious for everyone, and especially if it's the first dose. Remember that norepinephrine is probably a first line vasoactive medication, but consider early vasopressin again uh, for the benefits that we've talked about multiple times. And then there's little evidence exists that compare inotropic agents, but similar to left heart failure, a cardiogenic shock, consider dobutamine uh, if you needed an inotrope. And really only consider inhaled pulmonary vasodilators, I don't know that anybody would ever do this, but if you have appropriate uh, blood pressure support. Uh, and then disposition is critical, like we talked about. So putting together everything we talked about, what's important about the emergency department is we don't always have a diagnosis when someone walks in the door. Sometimes all we might know is that they're hypotensive. Actually, undifferentiated shock is up to 10 to 15% of patients who present with shock in the emergency department. So the question then becomes, how do we approach it? Um, and I think that the goal in undifferentiated shock is to try and get a diagnosis still. But ultimately, sometimes you might not. And then if the goal becomes, or it should always be first, is to stabilize the patient and then optimize the therapy. And if they're, they're persistently shocky, then they need to go to a critical care unit of some kind. So what I would say to this is, first, it's important to consider a small fluid bolus. So unless the patient is obviously bleeding out on the floor, um, it's very hard to hurt a patient with a small bolus of fluid, just to see if they're at least fluid responsive. Um, and there's a lot of good evidence actually recently that's come out that says that we underdose fluids. And that's because we're concerned of fluid overload. But often the bigger concern is really uh, resuscitation and making sure that it's appropriate. Um, your first line vasoactive agent of choice, if you have to use one in a patient on differential shock, I've hopefully convinced you is norepinephrine. Uh, 
I talk about this because at least recently at MRAP, they had a session where they talked about this, and the speaker who was on there said that they should use, you should use epinephrine as your first-line presser, and I would strongly disagree with that based on the evidence uh, that I hopefully presented to you and based on the existing guidelines that basically say for almost any type of shock, it's really, really hard to go wrong with norepinephrine first. Next, uh, consider utilization of vasopressin. So hopefully one of the things I've shown you is that most, ca most causes of shock respond really well to vasopressin. Um, and we always joke about it that there's really no use for it, but we're actually, and even in the ICU, people always joke about it. Um, but it's, the evidence is starting to add up that it might be something that's useful. And if you need an inotrope, uh, consider dobutamine. Uh, it is often probably the fastest one that's going to work, um, and it's, it's pretty reasonably easy for, for everyone to, to use. And then the next thing is make sure, have a very low threshold for initiating antibiotics. This is the one thing that I find uh, that we could probably improve on is that if a patient's hypotensive, you kind of have to sometimes even just assume that they have septic shock until it's proven otherwise, just based on how common it is. And giving somebody, I know we're all in the, the trying to limit antibiotic use, but giving somebody a, a dose of broad spectrum antibiotics in an undifferentiated hypotension, hypotensive patient is almost certainly never going to be wrong. And then the last thing is involve consultants early. So I know that we love getting a diagnosis, but sometimes the patients are just too unstable to get them to the CT scanner or whatever. And in those situations, sometimes you need help and sometimes you need to get them to a critical care unit. Or if you're using your diagnostic tools, which I didn't talk about because this is more about management than diagnosis, your POCUS is really telling you that it's one thing more than another, like there's intra-abdominal fluid or blood, uh, or there's a you know, cardiogenic shock, then it's important to involve uh, your consultants early. So uh, why this matters, uh, hopefully, you know, I don't need to tell you guys that. Like I said before, I think we pride ourselves on, on our treatment. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's about being with a family or being with a patient at really difficult times. But I think ultimately what our focus is and what it has remained is on providing the best care to our patients. And I would say that the last year in the ICU has taught me that we really do that very well in the emergency department. And I would encourage all of you to continue to do what you do um, because it certainly makes a huge difference uh, in the lives of these patients. So with that, I will end, and I'm happy to take uh, any questions or comments. Thanks so much for your attention.